Hi, Luke. How are you doing? Hey, Bolino. I'm well. How are you? I'm good. Thanks a lot for asking, and thanks for being our first guest at the very first episode of I Spring Podcast Series. Absolutely, it's an honor. I'm excited. I can't wait to talk more about instructional design today. Yeah, speaking of instructional design, um, this podcast series was designed for people just entering the e-learning world. And my first question that I'm dying to address to you is, what does an instructional designer do and can anybody become one? That's a fantastic question. And I think at this point in time, I have now had to just learn a saying that I keep on having to mention to other people because they're always this like, what do you do again for a career? It sounds different. I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. So this is what I say, is that I say when I'm introducing myself to somebody on a project, I say that I understand how people learn online. I use this knowledge to work with a subject matter expert, and then from working with them and developing a partnership or relationship, I'm able to essentially extract the knowledge out of our heads, out of a subject matter, and then taking what I know about learning sciences, I then go and combine these and then develop an online learning experience that's going to become meaningful, but also at the same time, it's going to be transparent and clear to my students about why they're learning about something and then how they're going to learn about it and go through this process. Process. So that to me is instructional design in a very quick little blurb. As far as for can anyone become an instructional designer, it's like almost like of a yes and a no, because yes, anyone can in theory become an instructional designer, just like how you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. I mean, I actually do believe that. At the same time, it does take a considerable amount of experience training and passion. I think that's my, my biggest thing is going to be that you need to certainly have a passion for going into this field of education. And it's also a little bit different because you're not a teacher, you're not an administrator, but you are in this own little unique world. We are designing these experiences. You're designing for someone to accrue this new knowledge, but you're kind of behind the scenes. At the same time, you're not. So it's a little bit different <laughs> for what it is that we actually do. I actually love this answer. And I think it can be applicable not only to instructional designers, but actually about any sort of any profession. If you have passion, if you're passionate about it, I think, boy, you can achieve anything in your life. But just you got to put you got to put thought to it. Exactly. Yeah. And. Actually, I know that you have a super interesting way of uh, becoming an instructional designer at MIT. So could you please share it with our audience? Yeah, it's a, it's a really strange one. And why I like to kind of tell this story too, so thank you for asking, is because I want folks to know about how I am just a normal person. There was a lot of people when I started to tell them that like, oh, I'm from MIT. They're like, oh, you must be this super genius. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Not at all in the slightest bit. I'm just somebody who's worked hard. That's, you know, that's really all. So to kind of take you back to my beginnings of everything from education, I actually failed out of high school. I just straight up hated school for so many years. I never understood why someone was teaching me something about this level four calculus or physics or something along those lines where I'm looking at it and I'm like, I don't want to go into any of these fields. None of these things are going to help me. I'm literally wasting my time. And I went to a private high school, which also cost thousands of dollars. So I'm wasting money on top of that. And eventually, I just burned out and I just flat out stopped trying, which led me to having to go back to summer school, not once, not twice, but three times in order to get enough credits to finally be able to go and transfer to a different school that then would accept me for my pitiful grades. And then from there, I actually went to a high school that had music courses. And that's what I wanted to become was actually a musician. As you're seeing behind me on the walls, I have a bunch of guitars. That's really what I wanted to do in life. So because of that, I had a passion for education that I never had before. Taking that, all my grades finally went up. I graduated with you know straight A's. I'm like, woo, finally. And then from there, I went to the only college that would accept me for my grades. And while I was there, I worked with somebody who was an academic advisor. 
And I did not know that this position existed at the time. I had no idea who she was or what she was there for. But as we started to work together, I realized that her job was essentially just focusing on the student experience and making sure that I was prepared for the real world. And I just thought that was absolutely incredible. And I'm like, well, what if I could do that? Now, at the time, I was going to school to become a graphic designer. So luckily for me, the stars kind of aligned with my graphic design skills and then caring about the student experience that an academic advising position opened up. I was able to be an advisor for thousands of students for a couple of years. From there, though, I found this really weird, unique role called the Creative Resources Manager, which essentially took my two passions of design and caring about the students and merged them into one. And I started to make these types of private courses for different things with the academic support team. So if you were going to be taking a course for the writing center or a course on um, for the peer tutoring center, anything like that, I was a person designing these courses. And at the time, I was like, all right, I want to design more. How do I do even more? And I started to network with every single instructional designer at the university just to ask them more about like, what, what do you actually do during the day? You design rubrics, you're creating content. You're work I was like, how does this really all work? And I really was trying so hard to become an instructional designer there. And it just, it never worked out. I must have applied for at least nine instructional design jobs. They never panned out for me. So finally I made the difficult decision to leave that university and then go and try to apply for uh, a university in Boston, which a role happened to pop up on LinkedIn for an instructional designer at Northeastern University. I applied. I actually saw that one of my colleagues who worked at the prior university worked there. I was able to pick her brain, ask her a thousand questions, and then prepared for this interview like my life absolutely was on the line. I did everything I could to pull all the stops in which I finally got hired and then after that point in time, I was at Northeastern for a bit, and then the opportunity at MIT presented itself, and I've always wanted to work at MIT because, you know, greatest institution on the planet. Obviously, I want to go work there. I uh, applied, and luckily, I got in, and I've been there ever since, and that's my extremely odd roundabout way of not really loving education of the slightest bit to now working at one of the highest regarded institutions, which is kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> I think that's a super inspirational story and I'm liking to hear that you are that you like your position right now and um, that's awesome that's amazing and I am super happy that you made your way from not loving the school <laughs> and not seeing a point in it to actually understanding your position and uh, enjoying it so much so Thanks for sharing. I hope that this is going to be super inspiring for all the all the people who are listening to the podcast. So, if just uh, speaking briefly about a favorite favorite part of being an instructional designer, what is it for you? The favorite part that I would say is that uh, I'm able to create these types of meaningful learning experiences, and like in my head, I'm like, okay. This is going to do a trick. This is going to be something that's going to change somebody's life. But then, you know, you don't really know until the courses start to roll out, people enroll in the programs and they take it. And then when you actually get that feedback and you can go and you can interview folks and hear more about how they use the content of the knowledge that you made, that is when something is just absolutely mind blowing, is this hearing from folks that they were able to take one of your courses and then go and apply everything that they just learned about into their life or to develop themselves or their skill or get a promotion or even just find a different passion that they never knew that they had. But because they took your course, now it sent them down to this different role that they never thought thought about before and hearing about that what you can actually do for impacting people when you're not actually the person who's in front of them who is the one teaching the content but you're still behind the scenes doing this and working with somebody being able to have that level of a significant difference in someone's life that's what i love about what it is that i do that's amazing and that's like a true impact that you have on these students lives i should say <laughs> 
I mean, sometimes too, it's just absolutely crazy that you would never, like, you would never know, unless if you actually talk to these people, in which luckily I do, I interview folks and hear more about like, did they find my content relevant and engaging? And did they do mm -hmm. so in a timely fashion? You know, all those things. But even talking to, um, I remember there was one person where she, she told me about how she was this, like, I'm actually making a change in my career because of this course that you, you made. And I'm like, how i was like how did our course do that but it introduced to her this whole new world but she had no idea it was this passion project of hers and all of a sudden she's like nope that's it i want to do this the rest of my life and you you know you never think about that when you're designing a little four-week course you're like yeah now nah, there's no way it's going to help some folks yeah there's going to be some upskilling involved but no it can have a drastic change and that is just so so cool to think about that's amazing uh, so yeah, thanks for sharing your favorite part. And what is the part that you don't really enjoy in instructional design? So that's also a fantastic question. And I'm glad you said that because I think we have been talking so much about how great it is to be an instructional designer, which it is, but also it is a job. So like, let's also be honest with people about how there's some <laughs> not so great things about your job. And I think one of them has been learning how to encounter the word no and finding ways around that. So you might be thinking about how in your perspective, you're like, oh, I know what's best for the students. I'm the one designing this. But then at the same time, when you're working with a subject matter expert, they're probably thinking the exact same thing. This is my content. I've designed courses like this for years. I know what works. And sometimes you need to be able to meet in the middle. And sometimes that just doesn't exist. There is no middle grounds. You are on complete opposite sides of a story. And now you need to figure out like, okay, how am I going to get around this problem when nobody is happy? And in some cases, you might have a plan B. And sometimes I mean, I've, I've had something that recently I fell to almost like plan E, where I'm going through every single backup plan and all of them didn't work. Where I'm like, okay, now what? And that's just the way that it is because instructional design, even though you might think that this is going to be like an individual type of a position, that's not true at all. It is very team-based. You are constantly working with a lot of stakeholders and communicating with every single department and all the ever different team members. And sometimes it's just the way that people are, they don't get along and you have to try to be able to handle those different types of conflicts and find those resolutions that are going to work for everybody. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, that's, I guess, true to any teams, not only in instructional design, but also just in the whole e-learning world. And um, you mentioned that you got to have plan B, <laughs> plan C, even E sometimes. But what is um, some other advice? Like if you could go back in time and give your past self an advice about instructional design, what would it be? So funny enough, I'm writing a book on this exact topic right now which is really funny, but you asked this question. So hopefully this is going to be coming out. Uh, this book will be launching in September about just everything I wish I knew before becoming an instructional designer is essentially all of those things. And certainly there is a chapter in there about the pros and cons about instructional design. But I think the biggest thing, though, is definitely going to be overall just working with SMEs in general has been the biggest and most interesting thing. But if I had known that it was gonna be a part of my job. And when I say SMEs for the folks at home, it's subject matter expert. And I did not realize just how involved I would be working with these folks. And at the same time, there are some projects where you're working with up to multiple SMEs, three, four, five, six, all depending upon the project. And that has been something that has been so fascinating is that if you are working with somebody, let's say you have a SME who is representative from like higher education, you have, let's say, uh, an instructor or a dean or, you know, someone along those lines. But then you're also developing and trying to make sure that you're getting the fair representation from the industry. Well, then you have SMEs who are actually like in the field. They're working in the manufacturing plants. They're the ones who are literally the boots on the ground. And you need to be able to work with those folks as well and then to figure out how am I going to put all these exact thoughts together when they don't necessarily align? So there is this so much um, human interaction of working with SMEs and negotiating, influencing, persuading, especially when somebody has no idea what online learning is. Or unfortunately, when somebody says that like, oh, online learning just must be multiple choice questions and quizzes, right? And you're like, Ugh, no, 
Right. <laughs> I know why you think that there's been this stereotype for years, but no, trust me, like, you know, instructional design and online learning has evolved since, you know, 2000, when you're probably taking your last online course, you know, like there's so many more things that we could do. So it's been that, it's just showing folks like the real power of online learning, what you can do, how to actually demo a course or a program or talk about how you need to win somebody over, even with like networking, for instance, if you can make somebody your champion, they become like your favorite, they absolutely love what you did for their program. Well, they're gonna talk to other SMEs and other instructors and other people in the organization and just say like, wow, it was so awesome to work with them. Look at what they did for my program. And that's what you're looking for. You want those types of people. So being able to just do a lot of people skills, human skills is really what I would say. Like, I wish I knew about all these things going in because I would have focused on developing different skill sets. So whenever someone is talking to me about becoming an instructional designer and they immediately go into talking about like using only tools or only talking about learning theories, I'm like, yeah, it's great. It's a part of it, but I guarantee the majority of things is working with people. And you need to work on those skills before anything else by far. And again, that's the part you probably do not think about beforehand when Never. choosing the profession, <laughs> Never. but then you just Never face it. No, if somebody actually said, oh, your job is going to be working with people and then you need to get everybody on the same page with you and then you're going to build a learning experience around that, you're like, oh that's my job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and sometimes that's great. Sometimes you get some incredible people to work with and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Like, I can't believe we're building, like we were designing a course the other day on AI and the professor that we were working with, he was able to find a way, um, this is a couple of uh, months ago when, uh, uh, not months ago, actually, it was even farther back than that. It was when COVID tests weren't available yet. He found a way using AI, but if you were able to actually cough into your iPhone, it would then pull all the different forms of data that we already had of what the cough sounded like of folks who actually had COVID-19, and it could defect it with your phone. So literally, before COVID tests existed, he was like, hey, I found a way to do this with AI and a smartphone. Check it out. And I'm like, cool. I get to work with you. Like, you are my subject matter expert. Like that's phenomenal. So I get to be a lifelong learner in that I then was basically teaching myself and working with him to say like, tell me more about AI. Tell me about machine learning. Like I have no idea that it was capable of doing such an incredible feat where I was just thinking more about how it was this going to be doing things as far as for like, you know, recommendations on Netflix and what show to watch next. I never thought about being able to try to solve a, do I have a virus? Yes or no? Like that, that never crossed my mind. So it was those things where you're like, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. Like I can, I can deal with this. This is fun. Yeah. So, so would you recommend not uh, to be afraid of that experience, uh, but more to embrace it and try to get the most out of it? Yes. Exactly. And I guarantee the more that you work with folks and the more you step outside of your comfort zone and, and really just to not be afraid of the fact that you don't have all the answers, which is the worst feeling when you have to first admit that to somebody where they're saying like, you know, they're, they're going to you because they're seeking you as the expert. And then there's almost like this level of fear that you're not going to kind of represent things correctly where you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be seen as the expert. I'm the go-to person. So like I have to be 100% crystal clear on literally everything. And sometimes it's just like, no, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I have no idea about how to implement this idea, but I'm going to find out. And that's the biggest thing is that you can just, just admit that you don't know. You have the opportunity to go and find out, connect with others, and then go and bring that back. So yeah, I mean, failure has been, as we've talked about with my story, I mean, failure is certainly a part of it. I have, I have failed forward many times. And that's kind of how I'm doing this right now is that I guess I'm just not afraid to, you know, not completely fall on my face, pick myself back up and then try again. Awesome. Yeah, I see you're fine. You're doing fine. So <laughs> that's yep, so far. perfect. <laughs> Knock on wood. So far, everything is fine. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we had an e-learning expert whose name is Emily Wood. And yeah, at one of our recent webinars, and one of the questions was something like, um, what do I do or what do you do if you are not a professional in a certain area? Like, how do you design a course? And then she says, I do it all the time. I just work with subject matter experts. That's, that's how you do it. That's how you get the information. 
Yeah, and unfortunately there is, I don't know where this rumor started, but I, I've had to squash that same uh, topic a bunch where people are like, I'm so afraid. What if I, you know, get a job and I have to go work within the, the school of, you know, like arts and sciences and I have no idea about any of those things. What do I do? I'm like, that's very normal. You're, it's, it's what it is. Like, no, like you're, you're the learning expert. You're not the content expert. It's, it's very different. So you're trying to figure out how to actually create instructions and designs around them. It's not, I mean, like, so any of the courses and programs that I've built out, there's been very few times where I actually knew the content so well, where I'm like, no worries. I got it. I can kind of figure it out on my own. But for the majority of them, especially at MIT, I mean, you think of every single nerdy tech there is between cybersecurity, AI, 3D printing, um, you know, you name it. I'm not an expert in literally any of those things. So I really had to be able to hone my craft and figure more things out. And yes, by all means, if somebody gives me a course on like education or leadership, like wonderful, that's, that's in my background. I'm happy to tackle that, but I never expect that. I always expect to go to a project where I'm like, no idea what this is, but that's also a part of the fun is that like you have to be a lifelong learner. Like you, you have to be, you have to enjoy learning. You have to enjoy also teaching yourself because that's, what's going to help you is that you basically need to be able to take all this content and then make something that's then going to teach another person. So you have to be able to absorb this content to digest it, interpret it, figure it out, and then to create new um, content around there. So it's it's that entire process. So if you don't like learning new things and you know going down that rabbit hole, then like then that role is not for you. Yeah, that's a that's a super cool thought. Thank you very much for pointing it out. And uh, as far as I know, well, actually, since you are a, an instructional designer at MIT. Uh, that means you work in the educational sector. And do you know how um, ID in corporate world is different from that in higher education? I do. I do. So my job is also kind of strange, too, because I am in, you're right, I'm in education, but I'm also in the professional development department at MIT. So the people who take my courses are typically organizations themselves. So it's interesting. I get both, essentially. I get, I get the best of both worlds, which is kind of cool. But I have talked now to many people who are in either higher education or for corporate. And the thing is, is that there's a lot of similarities there there are absolutely some differences don't get me wrong for sure there definitely are but there's a lot of similarities too because at the end of the day we still do the same type of thing we have instructional design models we know about learning we are creative thinkers we are problem solvers all of those things are still absolutely true a lot of the time though it comes down more to a few of like the nitty-gritty details of talking about the project scope of how long do you actually have to work on a project uh, what is the deadline going to be? What are the resources? What's the budget and the funding? So those all kind of come into play. And then, of course, we have other different things as far as we're talking about uh, even the pay. I mean, just to be transparent, corporate is going to pay more compared to higher education. Known fact, you can find that out from Glassdoor, reading any reports about what people make. But then, of course, from the educational standpoint, then you have all the different forms of like incredible benefits that an institution will typically have. So you need to be able to weigh out those. But what I would say, though, at the end of the day, if I was to make it just very clear for people, is that for higher education, you're going to be training students. Within the corporate world, you're going to be training employees. So where is your passion? Because if your passion is that you want to be able to go and develop the new uh, workforce and try to make them just like the very best they can possibly be and then go and lead this charge for whatever is coming next within whatever particular field you're going to be working in, then fantastic. You know, go do that. I have plenty of friends in training and HR, and that's what they love is that making their employees be able to go and then take their skills to the next level and then see that impact on the organization. And then all of a sudden now they're like, you know, the top organization in the planet which is absolutely wonderful. And the flip side, if you love education and your passion is that you love students and being able to see them grow uh, as far as being in the classroom and then trying to help them along their academic journey, well then follow that one. It's really, at the end of the day, what do you find meaningful? Where do you see your purpose? And that's what's gonna keep you going. Because if you just say, choose a higher ed for the benefits or you just choose corporate because it pays more, you're gonna burn out. And you're like, why am I here? I don't, I don't understand. Um, and the other thing too is that this is not a you're stuck there forever. 
So if you do want to talk and network with other people and they say that like, you know, corporate is where you really want to go and you go and do that for a couple of years, maybe you then take your skills and then go to a local university, you know, or vice versa. There's nothing that says that you can't, that you have to be stuck in one versus another. Um, so those are a couple of the different similarities and differences in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for going into detail with that. And also I am have one more question regarding that. Uh, do you think that the motivation is different, for example, for a student compared to a corporate worker, if it's stronger in one or another case or? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So depending upon, I would say go, there's a number of factors with motivation because you're going to definitely hear from some employees who are like, just leave me alone. I don't want to do this training. Why is this mandatory? You know, and that, and that will always exist. On the flip side, you're going to have some programs, say like, for instance, for leadership, where if somebody knows that they're going to be taking a program that by the time that they're done and they get a certificate and in the eyes of their employer, they are more likely to receive a promotion for what they're learning about, then clearly the motivation is going to be very different compared to a mandatory HR training. And then the same thing goes when it comes to students. If you have students who are taking a course in if they're major and they love, you know, like whatever subject matter you're talking about, well, then obviously they're going to be really jazzed about it and they want to take this course. Unlike if you're going to be forcing somebody to go and take an economics course because they have to, a part of their bachelor's, you know, they're, yeah, they're probably not going to enjoy it. You know, if that's like, if they hate numbers, which is like, if you're going to be trying to teach somebody like me back in high school, where I'm like, why am I taking math again for the fourth year in a row about whatever algebra geometry statistics you name it I took, you know i took them all where i'm like why like I, I don't understand then that's going to definitely factor into the motivation uh, heavily uh, as far as for what they want to do so am i correct that um you were saying that no matter what field it is if either it's higher education or corporate you can find that right motivation just to um inspire the student or the learner to take the course and be successful. Yes. And you should also be so clear in the outcome of if I take this, what am I going to be learning about? How is this going to help me? Which is why I said when I was talking about like how I introduced myself as an instructional designer, I specifically include that part of transparency in there because we have all taken a course before at some point in time where there are 10 learning outcomes and none of them match what you're going to be talking about. And they're written in such academic jargon where you're like, what? Like, what am I learning? I don't like, yeah, just give it to me in basic words. And if you can just do that, just say like, okay, you're taking this, at the end of the day, once this is done, you're going to walk away with this skill, this one, and this one. This is how it's going to help you. By far, someone's going to say, okay, because now you're showing them the goal. If you don't show the end goal as far as what they're going to do, it's just like with anything else in life, there you don't follow through. I mean, like imagine if you're going to be signing up for a new gym membership and you'd never set a goal. You're like, oh, I'm just going to show up there and wing it and hope for the best. You're going to clearly fail, which is why like so many people uh, for their New Year's resolution where they're like they're going back to the gym. They never set a goal. They, they don't have like mini goals or achievable milestones. They don't celebrate their wins. If you don't do like those basic things, which it doesn't take an instructional desire to see like how to motivate somebody. It's just kind of like, you know, common human knowledge to, to build those factors into there. And if you don't do that and if instead day one, you're like, all right, here's the course. Go do the thing, you know, like this whatever, uh, good luck, you know, like then, no, it's not, it's not going to work. Yeah, exactly. I, I definitely agree that sometimes the basic things are the most important ones that you need to focus on and then build up uh, on that base. Now, I would like to offer you to imagine that we are putting together sort of like a starter kit for an instructional designer. And let's think about the resources that we can put there. I definitely um, heard that you mentioned Glassdoor and also I would include your book there. But what are other resources? <laughs> so what's funny and I have like, I have so many answers um, to this question. And I, the thing is, well, let me, 
let me first give you a few answers and then I'll dive into everything. Uh, but as sure. far as for like for books go, for instance, whenever someone says like, what are the books for instructional design? Uh, Julie Dirksen wrote basically like the OG book on instructional design of how uh, design for how people learn, which has been like tried and true tested. Literally everyone under the sun has read that. Uh, Tim Slade's book for the e-learning designers hand guy has been fantastic. Uh, I've heard so many good positive reviews about that one. For me, I love Universal Design for Learning. That was actually the very first book I read about was UDL in the Cloud uh, by Dr. Novak and Tom Thibodeau. Uh, but they wrote a new book, actually, um, which is UDL and Blended Learning, uh, Thriving and Flexible Landscapes, which is Dr. Novak and Dr. Um, Tucker. And they wrote that new book, which is really for the 21st century instructional designer, thinking about how you're going to be designing courses for a blended learning approach. Very helpful kind of thing. Now, of course, there's a thousand other different resources you can go to as far as for from from podcasts to YouTube videos to, you know, like you name it. There are so many things out there. And I think that's starting to become a problem is that we have so many resources that right now, if you just Google instructional design resources, like a thousand are going to pop up. So whatever advice, you know, we're, we're currently giving to the folks at home as they're going about and doing these things. The one thing that I would just beg you to do is that don't just go and buy five books or go and watch like 20 YouTube videos. You need to be able to take action, which is the biggest thing by far. So for instance, to give you an example, um, I read the book, How Learning Works, which is essentially just literally talking about just how in, in, in the brain, <laughs> how does learning actually all come together? And what I was able to do though, was that how I did this was at first I set a goal, was that the very first goal of mine before even picking up the book was going to be like, how am I going to implement some new idea from talking about learning science that I can do in my course right away? From there, after I made the goal, then I was talking about well, what evidence of learning is actually taking place that I can say to myself that what I'm talking about is actually working. So if I'm able to talk some, to somebody about this new idea with learning and then defend my reasoning, that's showing growth. It's showing that I'm actually learning about this for real and I'm not just make-believing and trying to go through things. And then finally, I started to practice that as well. So taking action, going back into one of my courses, and I essentially rewrote some of the practice problems to now take this new concept and see if it actually made sense. And then I went back into the book and started to read some more. So the way that I consume content is almost like I read a chapter, I do a reflection piece on that, then I go and try to apply what I just learned, and then I review it, and then I go back to the book and keep on going. So whatever you do for your toolkit, if you want to take any of those books I just mentioned, or if you want to watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts or whatever, I just beg you at some point in time to stop consuming content and just start doing something. I love it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's common knowledge. It's just, but I know someone needs to say it. <laughs> but that's the hardest part. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Uh, actually, I have one more question that I just I just thought of. So, have you know, like, throughout your career of an instructional designer, have you know, noticed some changes in how people are consuming the information or how they learn that you now have to transfer the way you are building the content or the the training courses, or is this pretty much? staying on the same level but there are like little little tweaks that need to be applied yeah absolutely great question so no there are, things are changing um things are going to be changing even more rapidly now that we are coming out of this post pandemic world where people have been uh introduced to now every single type of media as far as for what they wanted to be able to do um i read a report that talked about how podcast consumption globally was actually up by like 42 percent compared to the prior year so folks now more than ever are turning to podcasts for instance so if that's the thing and you need to meet your learners where they are so if they're going to podcasts to consume content well guess what you're making podcasts like it's it's that simple is that if you're going to be designing something think about it from any type of stance of how can you take this one idea and then how can you go and try to expand that to make that enjoyable for all learners? So for some people out there, they're always going to be a tried, true, and tested, but they're like, I just want to read about it. 
no big deal. I'm like, all right, great, whatever. But you're going to have other people, though, who are going to love the YouTube video that you make about that. And perhaps you do animations or a voiceover or something along those lines. For other people, it's going to become a podcast. And then what's going to happen is that the magic of people trying out new things, as you offer all of these different ideas into the courses themselves, people are going to start exploring and they're going to start using that. And they're going to actually now go and use these uh, more because of the fact that this is what they they typically do. I mean, all of us use YouTube. So the fact that like we don't use YouTube in courses is just stupid. Like it, it, it is. So if you have students who are obsessed with games, well then guess what? Look into gamification. If you have students who are going to be doing something that in the real world is going to be almost like they need an extra level of preparation before diving on into there, well then it's time to start looking at simulations and trying to figure out how you can help them out. It's all those same types of concepts that you need to just add those into there. And I bet that by the time where that, whatever the future holds, I am sure that we're going to have like almost a new uh, additional resources section where previously it was like, oh, here's an extra case study. Here's an extra article. Knock yourself out. And then now it's going to be like, oh, OK, well, here's a podcast video. Here's a here's a new blog that we found about it. Here's a new blah, blah, blah. Like that's what it's going to be. <laughs> Awesome. And since we are talking about how things are changing and we are jumping into future a little bit, I wanted to ask uh, if you could probably make some predictions about the future of e-learning, um, maybe what skills uh, the learners will have, um, what makes instructional designers successful in their job, like maybe how do they look? Just just think about, let's picture this portrait and maybe this will actually happen <laughs> and we will be the predictors <laughs> right now, right here on this podcast. I mean, I'll take it. And I, I started actually writing that. It's one of the chapters in the book where it's kind of funny. Like, I'm not a futurist, like by any means. I'm just like, well, I'm just I'm observant. I notice trends and I talk to a lot of people so I can try to like figure out like potentially what's coming next. My overall guess best guess i possibly can is that the courses are going to be more about the students so they're going to be more centric around them for everything so what i mean by that is that in the future what am i guessing is that we're going to be designing the types of online courses with them in mind more than ever we already say that we do that which we're not wrong but for instance i i teach um online as well and in one of my courses i started to implement learner check-ins so at the end of the week, learners would be sitting to me a, either a video or a written check-in just to ask more about how things are going. Like, do you have any questions around the content? Has anything popped up? But also on the flip side, I'm just asking more about the human side of just like, are you okay? How are things in your world? Because I don't know. I can look at data. I can read different things, but I, I simply don't know unless if you tell me. And by doing that, that has created this whole different new world that I never had before this, where you know, learners were telling me as they're submitting over into their videos and their written responses. And yeah, for most of the time, they're saying they're well and good and everything is fine. But for some of them, they're like, Dr. Hobson, we can't um, hire anybody right now. We can't find the proper staff or what it is. So like, I'm currently working like 80 hours a week. I'm so far behind, you know, like uh, I'm going to try to catch up if I can, but I don't know if I can actually do this. I need some help. I had other people who told me that they got laid off and they're like, oh my gosh, like I'm in survival mode. I'm just trying to find a new job ASAP. I promise within a couple of weeks, whenever I'm finally back up and running, I'll do my best to submit something over to you. Now, just by looking at their grades and seeing that somebody got a zero or they didn't submit something, I'm literally walking in the dark here, just saying like, so what do they need? How do I support them? But by implementing these check-ins, this created this new opportunity for people to tell me exactly where they're struggling. And maybe it is something for time management or for a help with additional resources for the content. But for nine times out of 10, it was just the fact that people are like, I need help as a human being, please work with me. So as instructional designers, if we can provide this opportunity for instructors to be able to connect with students in a different way, that's just going to open up a whole new uh, series of doors. It's going to be able to create all these new opportunities for folks to be able to really support them in the correct way and not just guessing. So that's where I think we're going is we're focusing on people more than anything else. I think that's a great way to go. <laughs> I think so, too, which is why I said it. Uh, and I do have one more, too, which kind of goes into that, which is kind of interesting. So I want to ask you, have you heard of the term VTubers before? 
VTubers. BTubers. E2, no. <laughs> no, okay. So, neither have I until the other day. And this is why I'm like, huh, like I think this would work. So, a VTuber is essentially a virtual YouTuber. Instead of them being on camera, there is something else that is a virtual image of themselves who's the one that's doing the talking. And we have enough um, tools out there that is sophisticated enough to actually be able to monitor and see what they're doing for the mannerisms and then to be able to replicate that on screen. And perhaps it's going to be, you know, like a cutesy little animal or a 3D version of themselves or an anime character, or, you know, something along those lines. But the world of being burned out by being on camera constantly is this so annoying where you're like oh, i'm on camera again for the 27th time today i can't believe this and students feel that same way like we feel it as adults but clearly you know students are thinking about this in the exact same manner so what if we gave the option to make students more comfortable on camera by allowing them to not really technically be on camera and having a different representation of themselves so that that way the instructor doesn't feel like they're just talking to a bunch of black screens on Zoom, but now they're actually being able to focus on something and to still interact with them. Now, this, of course, also goes into the fact that we have now somehow developed these weird Zoom etiquette rules, like it's weird to eat on camera. That's seen as disrespectful. But if you have a little, you know, cutesy animal eating on camera, then like, whatever, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. So I'm just trying to think of like, what what is gonna make students comfortable with online learning? Because they still want online learning. There's still going to be synchronous components where you have to do something in real time with instructors, but just how can you make people feel more at ease and more at home? And I bet by using some of these types of softwares with VR and with XR, and there's a lot of them, um, there's a whole bunch you can go down from using uh, Vroid Studio, Ready Player Me, um, there's there's a, a ton of them that do exist that work for anyone's budget and what in particular they want to do and whatnot. But I bet that's what we're going to do, especially for younger students, for kids in K through 12. You you don't want to be on camera all day. It's just it's oh, it's awful for the kids. So I bet we're gonna look at that closely for for going forwards. Yeah, that's actually an interesting thought. And uh, to be honest, I heard of that technology and actually <laughs> heard, maybe that's going to be a little off topic, but I heard the news that Bruce Willis, the actor, he uh, took part in the commercial using this technology. So he was not present, he was not live <laughs> at the moment of the shoot, but they're just been using this tech. So there, there we go. We already have some place to apply this new tech, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah, some of the, uh, and hopefully we never get to, I mean, we're already far down that rubble. Everything like with the deep fakes and how people are like being able to now, I saw this morning that some people, um, they were looking, no, sorry, an organization was looking to pay people to use their likeliness for what they wanted to do for commercials. So instead of them, they just wanted to be able to take their picture and then using AI, they were going to make them move and all those things of that nature. But they're essentially like, licensing their image to an organization it's like oh here, this is the future this is this is where we're yeah, going that's the next level i guess <laughs> yeah that's it that's where we're going it's crazy yeah but um speaking of the future i was actually thinking about the past do you remember the first ever the first course that you created oh that's a great question the first course that i ever created or or maybe the the first, let, let's put it this way the first course that you course that you were mostly proud of sure i mean well i remember both uh because the first one i ever made was a writing course for the literally for the writing center about uh apa style woo super fun um so that, that was the very first thing i ever made for the course that i'm most proud of though that's interesting i think if i had to pick I really did enjoy building um, at MIT. We have an entire series on just leadership courses. There's like, you know, eight of them that talk about basically anything you could possibly think about within um, leadership. But we made them specifically for leadership within engineering. So it was a different take on leadership because you have a lot of folks within engineering who almost see management as being like a, a negative response They're like oh, i don't want to i don't want to manage people i like my work so it was really interesting trying to build those programs and then being able to see uh the results of those and tell these folks more about 
culture and networking and talking about business strategies and how to actually innovate in the real world and not just, you know, from trying to do something that you think is real innovation, but being able to really help them with what they wanted to do. Uh, that by far was so cool because we were able to see from there within the discussion boards and whatnot, we were able to see folks communicate with each other and they didn't realize that they were actually in the course together. Um, so what I mean by that, because that sounds super confusing, is that we had what well, the same organization send the learners through a program, but they were at different locations. And then within some of the collaborative tools, like using the peer reviewed uh, assessments and then moving over into the discussion boards, they realized that they were trying to solve the same problem, but at different locations. So they use the content of the course as that spark to try to figure out how do we solve the problem. And then it did. It actually helped solve a problem for um, this uh, uh, well-known organization within the little um, department. But that was just so cool to see people come together using what we created and, uh, and, and seeing like the fruits of a labor of how that all came together. That's awesome. Is it still on? Is it is, like, can, can people still go and take this course? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All the courses still exist. If you just Google MIT X Pro, all of our all of our courses will be listed for everything, for all the leadership and and any of the leadership ones, I essentially had a hand in in some capacity. So <laughs> whether it's culture or networks or radical innovation, critical thinking, uh, working with teams, system thinking, there's a, there's a whole whole mess of them. Um, but yeah, those are those are also there. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, thanks for sharing that information, and I think that maybe some of the folks listening to us today will be curious to go and check them out. <laughs> it's just so cool to see. Um, and we're able to use some of those examples too. Like, so for within the courses, if you're going to be talking about designing case studies, I mean, one of the, we were talking about student motivation earlier. One of the ways to motivate students is really to be able to give more real world examples of how real companies had a problem, they figured out how to solve it, and here's the method that they did. And oh, hey, you can replicate that as well. So for one of the courses, we actually go through like every big company I can think of. And we talked about some of the ways that they develop products from like Apple, Google, Tesla, um, all those big heavy hitters. And we're able to actually talk about different forms of case studies around there. And it's just, and like, and that's fun because that's just cool. Cause you're like, Hey, I can actually pull, like I can pull up this article and show you like where they use this. Now let's break it down. And now let's talk about the takeaways of how you can go to your organization or your uh, journey and try to be able to map out like where does this fit in? So that's just so neat. Yeah, yeah. amazing. All right. So I think uh, we can wrap up our today's session, our today's episode. And I think the biggest takeaway that I can think of today's podcast is that it's not um, enough to only read the material, but also to try and implement it in real life. So thanks a lot for bringing that up again, <laughs> but I think that's super important. It is, it is, because I know just what it is, especially for academics, you just think like, oh, I'll buy a book, that's gonna solve the problem. And it's like, no, it won't, like it's, this, it's one tool. Of all the things you can do and all the things you can learn about, it's one. I mean, like I and I've done it too. Like, don't get me wrong. There was a new book I have behind me about uh, conflict resolution for managers. I bought that book. It was recommended to me from a friend. I haven't opened it up yet. Not a clue what's inside of it. I bought it and was like, oh, I'll totally read that when something happens. And nope. And uh, I, I haven't touched it since. So it's just like. I have to remind myself, it was a good reminder for everybody, including me, that like, if I'm going to do this, like, you need to stick with it. You need to make a goal. You need to talk about how you're going to be able to show evidence that you're actually learning and assess your own knowledge and then practice it and apply it and then review. It's just common things, but just it takes that extra little bit of effort to really make that, that extra mile. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So to wrap up, actually, Luke, can you name just one thing? that you think is the most important uh, that every instructional designer or future instructional designer should do right now after this podcast to make one step further in their career path. Yes, you need to go on LinkedIn and network with other instructional designers. 
is very simple. Uh, you need to be able to surround yourself with other people in the field because it is true in that your inner circle, the people who you hang out with all the time, they influence you no matter what. So the people that I talk to daily are other instructional designers who also push me outside of my comfort zone. And they're the people who I go to where if I'm making something new, I mean, even like for making the book or when it came to making my own courses or the YouTube channel, you know, you name it. I, I talk to other people and just say like, what do you think? Is is this a good idea? Like, is, is this something that you could see the value in? Like, give me your honest feedback because I don't want you to sugarcoat it. Like, really just give me the, the truth of what you think about. And you want to be able to get feedback from people who you actually respect and admire and know what they're talking about. And by doing networking, you can bring those people into your inner circle because everyone will always give you their feedback, but they don't have a clue what they're talking about. So it's kind of just all stupid and pointless. So find the knowledgeable people, bring them in. And then, hey, guess what? For all you new instructional designers out there is that the people who post instructional design jobs more than anyone else are the instructional designers who are hiring on their own team. And they're going to post a job posting before Anyone before the organization, they'll give you a heads up ahead of time. I have seen it now a million times of someone saying, hey, my team is looking to bring on two new instructional designers. The job posting's not out yet, but hey, message me for more in details. I've seen that so many times. So if you find those people within LinkedIn specifically, that's been my go-to platform because it's more of the professional development kind of like networking platform. Nothing wrong with Facebook or Twitter or anything else, but but LinkedIn is definitely my jam. So Connect with others. Feel free to add me if you want to. By all means, uh, I post a lot of instructional design content, as you would probably assume. So, uh, you know, definitely that is like the one step I would say is just go make a LinkedIn profile, go start networking with other people, search for instructional designers, find them, add them, talk to them, and just treat them like real human beings and just watch as your relationships will help you out in your career. Thank you so much for this priceless advice. I really mean it. I think that that's. It's, it's simple, again, but super important to be doing. And yeah, Luke, thank you so much for being our first guest on this first podcast episode series. I hope it goes um, and becomes super successful. But most of all, I hope that our listeners, our audience will find it useful and that this episode will be extremely motivational to them to go out there and actually do something in um, just embracing or searching their uh, bright future in instructional design. That's the hope. <laughs> that's, that's certainly the goal. And thank you once again for having me on. It was a blast chatting about all these things. Yeah, absolutely. So for everybody listening to us right now, I will be putting um, Luke contact details in the description for this podcast. So if you want to get in touch or follow him or listen to his wonderful and amazing podcasts, you are, you can do that for sure. All right. I hope that everyone has a wonderful day and you will hear us in the next episode. Bye everybody. And bye Luke. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>